In this video, I'll introduce you to the concept of capital structure, and I'll discuss why a risky capital structure could be a bad thing. I'll also discuss the relationship between debt and earnings per share. Finally, I'll show you the effects of the tax shield on firm value through a fairly complicated example. Let's get started. Capital structure can be thought of as the combination of debt and equity used to finance a firm's operations. Some firms prefer to issue more debt than equity to finance their operations, while others choose the exact opposite option. There are many reasons why a firm would prefer more debt as opposed to more equity, and we'll show a couple of those. And then in the second part of this video series, I'll actually discuss some of the theories for why a capital structure of a firm is what it is. Now, some firms will actually try to target a specific capital structure and usually that means targeting a specific debt to total assets ratio or a specific debt to equity ratio but a lot of firms will actually not have a specific target capital structure and rather they'll actually let their capital structure fluctuate through time the first factor that determines the ratio of debt and equity a firm chooses to fund its operations is business risk. A couple of lectures ago, I discussed some other types of risk called firm specific and market risk. The business risk I'm referring to can be thought of as a subset of firm specific risk. Business risk refers to the risk associated with the firm's operations, ignoring any financing costs. Factors that affect the firm's net operating income, like changes in demand for products or the price at which a firm sells its products, are business risks. There are at least four that should be highlighted, but I'll only discuss four here. The first is sales variability. If a firm's sales are more variable, there's a greater volatility in net operating income that's going to occur from quarter to quarter, and the firm could run a net operating loss if the firm's sales drop off significantly. The second factor affecting business risk is input price variability. If the inputs or supplies necessary to produce a firm's products are volatile, chances are the firm's price that it passes on to consumers is also going to be volatile. For example, if a firm sells coffee and the price of coffee beans increases dramatically, then the firm's profit margin will likely shrink if it can't pass those costs on to consumers. Whether or not the firm can pass on costs to consumers is a third major factor we consider when we estimate our business risk. If a firm is in a less competitive industry or an industry where there's a great deal of product differentiation, it might be easier for the firm to increase prices it charges consumers. However, if a firm is in, let's say, the fast food industry or the grocery industry, it might not be able to raise prices without losing customers to competitors. The ability to adjust output prices for changes in input prices is the third major factor affecting business risk. Finally, some firms are in industries that require them to have a good large amount of fixed capital before they can produce a good. The extent to which costs are fixed is a firm's operating leverage. Auto manufacturers are a great example of firms with high operating leverage. Firms with a high degree of operating leverage are riskier than firms with low operating leverage because if a firm has a large amount of fixed costs relative to their variable costs, this firm will be hurt far more by a small decline in sales revenue. The other important risk that we'll discuss in this lecture is financial risk. And financial risk is the risk that occurs when a firm uses financing alternatives that require fixed periodic payments. We can often measure the financial risk of a firm by examining its financial leverage. That is, the extent to which fixed income securities are used in the firm's capital structure. Financial leverage is useful to a firm because in some situations it can increase the earnings per share of the firm. This is true because of the tax shield, which we discussed briefly in the last lecture on the cost of capital. Now, the tax shield allows a firm to decrease its taxable income by the amount of interest it pays to its creditors, thus ensuring the firm pays less in taxes and has more in earnings per share. The drawback to financial leverage is that the more highly levered a firm is, the larger the regular interest payment a firm owes to its creditors each period. If a firm has really volatile cash flows, a higher degree of financial leverage can actually force a firm into bankruptcy. Let's talk about the ideal capital structure for a firm. The ideal capital structure is the structure that maximizes shareholder value. For most firms, there's a happy medium where the pros and cons and of debt will offset. 
Although a very high degree of financial leverage can increase the earnings per share on a firm's income statement, it can also increase the probability of bankruptcy. If a firm is forced to declare bankruptcy because it couldn't pay its creditors, the value of its shares will often fall very close to zero or to actually zero. Therefore, shareholders should often be wary when a firm has a very high debt to total assets ratio or when the interest expense of the firm is very high relative to the earnings before interest and taxes of the firm. Now, let's talk specifically about how financial leverage affects earnings per share. If a firm is starting from a very low level of financial leverage, then increasing the amount that it borrows and then has to pay back can benefit the firm by increasing the interest expense and thus the tax shield of the firm. That is, while earnings before interest and taxes will not change, the earnings per share will increase because the interest expense is not taxable. However, if a firm becomes too highly levered, the firm's credit rating will increase and the borrowing costs, aka the interest rate for the firm, will become very large and any tax benefit the firm receives from borrowing will be consumed by the increase in the interest expense. Let's look at this via an example. All right, so this is an example I've given in a couple of more advanced corporate finance classes in the past, but it does allow us to see the benefits of financial leverage. In this example, we have a firm that can fund its operations through three different capital structures. The first is just a capital structure that is completely funded through equity. The second is a capital structure where 25% of the capital raised is raised by a bond issuance. And finally, we have a capital structure where half of the capital raised is raised by issuing debt. So this example is going to show us exactly how the value of a firm changes as we lever up. And it'll also allow us to see how the price per share changes and the value of the equity specifically will change. Now, in this case, Notice that we start off with different number of shares here. So we have 100 shares starting out for zero equity, 50 for equal equity and debt stake. Now, the value of the debt here, we're going to set this as zero for the 0% 0 equity stake, obviously. With a 25% equity stake, I'm going to set this to 2,500, meaning that we've f borrowed 2,500 and we have issued equity and raised 7,500. So grand total, this firm should start off be being worth $10,000. And then finally, in this equal weighted case, we have a value of $5,000 for a debt. All right, next, let's take a look at how these different capital structures affect the net income of these firms or this firm under different uh, capital structures. All right, so. With the unlevered capital structure, obviously, if we have an earnings before interest and taxes of 2,103, well, we're not paying any interest expense on our debt. So our pre-tax profit is 2,103, and our taxes, assuming we have a 34% tax rate, are going to be $715 and change, and our net income is going to be about $1,390. With a 25% debt stake, our interest expense is going to be just our 2,500 times the pre-tax cost of debt, so 175, and that will decrease our pre-tax profit by that amount, that 175. So our pre-tax profit is a little lower here than it was in the base case. Why? Well, it's because you can deduct interest expenses from the uh, from your EBIT to determine your your taxable income. Now, because of that, we also have a lower amount that we're paying in taxes. So, this nineteen twenty eight multiplied by thirty four percent gives us six hundred and fifty five time point five two, and a net income that is slightly lower than it was in the base case. And if we divide by the number of shares outstanding, so just 1,272 and 48 cents divided by 75 shares, we get an earnings per share that was a little higher than it was in the base case. Now, in the final case, because we have more debt that we've borrowed here, 
our interest expense is going to be correspondingly larger. So just $5,000 times 7% gives us our interest expense this quarter or this period of $350. And that's going to decrease our pre-tax profit. And that's also going to decrease the amount of taxes that we have to pay and correspondingly decrease the net income that we have. Now, because half of our capital is being raised through a debt issuance, this means that we have fewer shares that we've issued. And therefore, even though we have a lower net income, when we divide that by the number of shares outstanding, we actually get a higher earnings per share because obviously we, we're dividing by a smaller number of shares. All right, next, let's take a look at the effect of the different capital structures on the cost of equity. All right, so our residual cash flow is just going to be our net income plus our depreciation minus our capital expenditures. And this is really what you can think of as free cash flow. I mean, assuming our, our working capital hasn't really changed that much, we'll, we'll just go ahead and uh, set our free cash flows or residual cash flows here. And our cost of equity, notice here that our cost of equity is increasing as we increase the amount of debt. We'll talk about why that is later in this lecture, but suffice it to say, firms that lever up are more risky, and therefore investors require a larger compensation for holding shares of those companies. Now finally, let's take a look at the change in the value of equity as we lever up, and then the value of the firm as we lever up. So in the base case, we have no debt, and the value of our equity, our 100 shares, is worth about $10,000. There's a bit of a rounding error there, but oh well. Now, we don't have any debt, but in this 25% debt case, notice that the value of our equity is slightly decreased, but the total value of the firm is actually increased. How much is it increased by? Well, it's increased by the value of the tax shield. And the tax shield is really just our total debt multiplied by our tax rate of 34%. And so if we were to multiply 2,500 by 34%, that's where we get that 849 or what should be $850. Uh, so what this example shows is that as you increase the amount of debt relative to equity for your firm, as you lever up, the value of the firm as a whole will increase by the total value of the tax shield. Now, obviously, our, our value of our shareholders' equity is less than it was in the previous example. And to get each of these, what we're doing is we're taking our residual cash flow or free cash flow and dividing it by the cost of equity. So that's how we get this. But our total firm value is really just the base case value plus the value of the tax shield. And you can see that again here in this equal weighted case where we have a value of equity that's a little lower, but the value of the debt is much greater than it was in the 25% debt case. And the value of the tax shield is what is being added to this $10,000 from the base case and changing that to about $1,700 uh, in added value. So if we were to multiply this $5,000 in debt by our 34% tax rate, uh, that's how we get that, that additional value added to the firm. We'll talk about the value of the tax shield to the firm in a bit, but this is just our, our first example, so I, I thought I'd just introduce it here. Now, finally, take a look at the share price of this firm in each case. Notice that the share price increases as we lever up. Now, this increase in the share price isn't always linear. It won't always be a unit. I mean, our, our share price won't always uh, increase as we lever up. At some point, if let's say we're levering up to the point where the firm is far more likely to default, at that point, we would expect the share price to actually start decrease as we lever up further because we're, we're more likely to uh, face bankruptcy. But in this case, notice that when we divide the value of our equity by the number of shares outstanding, we're seeing an increase as we lever up. This is a very common occurrence, and it's one of the reasons why firms or managers of firms like to lever up, because 
levering up does increase the value of the stock, or it does increase the shareholder's value, which is obviously what we're going for. All right, let's move on. All right, let's talk about something else. So realistically, what happens when we lever up, meaning when we borrow more, is that our cost of debt is going to increase. And this is because there's a greater likelihood that the firm will default on its debt obligations. Here, in this example, you can see that as our debt to total asset ratio increases, so does our cost of debt. So as we go from a an unlevered case, let's say we have a firm that has total assets of $1,000 and its debt to total asset ratio is in the second column. As we increase the debt to total assets, the cost of debt will typically increase. And the reason for this is simply because as the firm becomes higher and higher levered, it becomes more and more risky for potential creditors to lend money to this firm because this firm is less and less likely to pay those creditors back. So in compensation, those creditors demand a much higher interest rate. Now this increase in the cost of debt is going to affect our weighted average cost of capital, but we'll talk about that in, in a bit. Now, let's take a look at the graphical interpretation of financial risk and business risk. Regardless of whether your firm borrows, it'll still be subject to business risk. Remember, business risk is the risk of a decline in sales, rising costs, or anything else that affects our net operating income, aka our EBIT, or earnings before interest and taxes. The financial risk of a firm is represented here as the difference between the black line and the green line. So I've just put a black line here, and here we have it. So notice that as a firm borrows more, as measured by debt to total assets, the firm's financial risk grows. We often represent risk using what I have here, which is the coefficient of risk, uh, the coefficient of variation, which is our, our y-axis variable. Now, let's take a look at the data that I used to create that graph. Notice that for many of the levels that we have here for debt to total assets, our expected earnings per share is increasing. At some point, it's going to start to decrease, right about here at the 70% debt to total asset ratio. Firms like Toys R Us or Sears are good examples of this. In those examples, the firm borrows so much that any new borrowers demand a higher interest rate before they lend. This costs the firm more to raise capital, and thus, even though their tax shield is much larger, the earnings per share decreases nonetheless. Now, let's talk about all the ways that leverage affects firm value. There are many ways that increasing borrowing can affect firm value. First, as I've just mentioned a couple of times, an increase in leverage increases the tax shield, which is the protection from taxes that is embedded in the U.S. tax code. Second, as you've already seen, an increase in leverage increases the cost of debt. Next, as, you'll, as you will see, an increase in leverage increases what's called our levered beta, which will lead to a higher cost of equity and correspondingly a higher weighted average cost of capital. Also, an increase in debt will increase the weight of debt we assign in the weighted average cost of capital formula and thus decrease the weight that we assign to equity. And finally, if a firm is making payments to bondholders, it can't pay that same cash to shareholders. So leverage will decrease the free cash flows the shareholders would otherwise receive. There are a number of other ways that leverage impacts firm value, like through the impact on corporate governance, but we'll just focus on these five factors for now. Now, notice that an increase in leverage is going to affect firm value both by affecting the cash flows of the firm and also by affecting the components of the weighted average cost of capital. The tax shield will increase the cash flows of the firm, while the change in the weighted average cost of capital is a little more complex. We might see an increase in the cost of debt, we'll certainly see an increase in the cost of equity, but we'll also see a change in the weights of debt and equity. So it's, it's not entirely clear whether the weighted average cost of capital will increase as we lever up or decrease. It usually will decrease, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, let's talk about how each of these factors affects firm value in a little more detail. There are two ways that we can calculate the value of the tax shield. The first is by calculating the value of the tax shield in the current period. 
It's simply the amount of debt the firm has outstanding multiplied by the firm's average tax rate and also multiplied by the average interest rate of the firm's debt. The value in the current period represents the amount by which the firm's net income in the current period increases when the firm levers up. The second value we have here is the total value of the tax shield over the life of the firm. It's simply the total debt of the firm multiplied by the tax rate of the firm, which is what you saw in that, that earlier example involving that, uh, those three capital structures. This value represents the total value of the firm for being levered. In other words, if the firm had no debt, the value of the firm would be what it is today minus the product of the debt multiplied by the tax shield. In other words, by levering up, you increase the value of the firm by the amount of the debt times the tax rate of the firm, the average tax rate of the firm. Now, let's see how the tax shield directly affects the value of the firm. I'm going to use the same example I started with in this lecture and show you that the increase in the value of the firm is nothing more than the increase in the tax shield. All right, so here we have the exact same example that we did a little earlier. And this time, I'm going to measure the value of the firm in these three cases with these three different capital structures in a slightly different way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to discount all of the cash flows of the firm by the weighted average cost of capital. And then I'm going to add in the value of the tax shield. All right, so let's get started. Let's assume that in each of these three cases, the cash flow is the same. We'll assume that the, the EBIT doesn't change, the uh, taxes that the firm is paying doesn't change, and we'll assume that the, the firm's unlevered beta and risk-free rate and market risk premium don't change. And in that case, our unlevered weighted average cost of capital is going to stay the same. Fair enough. That's, that's not entirely realistic, though. Uh, so in each of these three cases, because we're dividing our free cash flow by our unlevered weighted average cost of capital, we get the same value of the firm right here, the value of the unlevered firm. All right, now let's take a look at the impact that the levering up of the firm has on firm value. All right, so we already saw from the previous example using this data that in the base case, we're not going to have any interest expense because in this case, the firm has zero debt and therefore it's making no interest payments on its debt. In the 25% case, as you saw earlier, we're multiplying the amount of debt that the firm has outstanding by the pre-tax cost of debt, so 7%, and that's how we get this interest payment. And our tax reduction is going to be just that 175 multiplied by the tax rate, which was in the previous example, 34%, and it's listed up here near the top. And we saw larger numbers for the case where half of the firm's capital is raised through debt. Now, the benefit of the tax shield is this. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply the amount of debt the firm has by 34%. And that's going to be the total value of the tax shield. So in the case where we funded 25% of the firm's capital through debt, we had $2,500 in debt, and we have a tax rate of 34%. If you multiply that out, you get 850. And if we add that 850 to the firm, well, that gives us our total value of the firm pretty close to about the, the original unlevered value plus the, the, the value of the tax shield. I realize there's a rounding error here, but, uh, well, forgive me for that one. And then also, if we have, let's say, $5,000 that we've raised through a debt issuance, like we have in this equal weight uh, capital structure, if we multiply that, that $5,000 by 34%, we get $1,700. And if we add that to the firm, we get the exact same value of the firm that we had in the previous example. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the value of the firm increases as we Incre as we lever up, as we increase the tax shield. Now, the second factor that I mentioned that would change as firms lever up is the interest expense or the yield to maturity or the cost of debt. As a firm increases its debt to total assets ratio, the increase in debt often makes creditors more nervous that they're not going to get repaid. 
This leads lenders to increase the yield they demand for buying a firm's bonds, and it can often lead credit rating agencies to downgrade the firm's debt, signaling to investors that the debt is less likely to be repaid, and thus pushing the yield to maturity higher. So obviously you can see that here. If we go from, let's say, a thir we'll say a, a one-year bond or a bond with a one-year time to maturity, uh, the interest rate on that, if it's a AAA rated bond, might be 52 basis points. But as we decrease the credit rating of this bond, you can see it goes down to 5.22% if it's triple B rated, and then all the way up to 8.32% if it's B rated, which is you know, just above default range, which is typically in the Cs. All right, now let's talk about the third way that an increase in leverage will affect firm value, and that's through an increase in the beta. In finance, we have a formula for calculating the beta of a firm that borrows money. In essence, we take our unlevered beta that I showed you how to calculate a couple of lectures ago in the stock lecture, and we multiply it by the quantity of one plus the quantity of one minus the marginal tax rate times the amount of debt the firm has, all divided by the firm's shareholders' equity or total equity. The reason we use this formula is because if a firm borrows money, the increase in the interest expense increases the likelihood that the firm will be unable to pay its debts. When this happens, the firm will be in what we call technical default and its share price will fall to practically nothing. The additional risk that comes with levering up is captured by this levered beta. Now, an increase in the firm's beta means that the firm's cost of equity, or as it's sometimes known, the required return or the expected return, will increase. We use the capital asset pricing model to determine the cost of equity. Now, let's take a look at an example of how this increase in the cost of equity, as well as the decrease in the weight of equity, affects firm value. What we're going to do now is use that same example with the three different capital structures, and we're going to look at that in another way. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the cost of equity to be increased by allowing the beta to be levered up. And then we'll take a look at how that affects the value of the firm. So let's start off with the weights. So when a firm levers up, obviously the market weight of its debt and the market weight of its equity are going to uh, change. So if, let's say, our firm goes from a 0% debt and 100% equity capital structure, aka a 0% debt to total asset ratio, uh, to, let's say, one where 25% of the capital is funded through debt, in that case, we're going to see an increase in the, the weight of debt that we're going to use to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Now, notice here that that weight of debt that we're going to use in the weighted average cost of capital formula is not 25%. It's only 23%. The reason for this is because this 25% debt number, this is the number on the balance sheet. It's essentially the book value of debt. When we estimate the weight of debt, we want to use the market weight of debt or the value of the firm's debt listed on the market. You know, what, what it's actually worth today divided by what it's actually worth today plus what the equity is worth today. Uh, so that's why we get a slightly different number here. So our market weight of debt here, we'll say it's 23%, and then market weight of equity is 77%. And then for the equal weighted case, we'll say that our market weighted debt is going to be 43% instead of 50%, and 57% of the value, the market value of the firm is going to be in its equity. Now, let's take a look at the levered beta and how we use that. So here's our levered beta formula. It's the one I introduced a few seconds ago. And if we want to lever this firm's beta up, we need to know it's unlevered beta, which was given in the earlier example. And all we have to do now to lever up our beta is plug in the marginal tax rate, the value of the debt, in this case, the, the book value of the debt, and the book value of equity. So in this case, we're going to take one plus one minus our tax rate, or we'll assume that we have a marginal tax rate of 34%, and 
multiply that by 2,500, and we're going to divide that by 8,350. And the reason we're going to divide that by 8,350 is because if you remember a couple of minutes ago, that's what we actually calculated the value of the equity in this 25% case to be. And that gives us a levered beta when we lever up to 25% of 0 0.958 instead of that 0 0.8 beta that we had when the firm was unlevered. All right, now let's get our levered beta for the case where we have equal weighting in our debt and equity. So here we again have our levered, our unlevered beta of 0 .0, of 0.8 and we take the quantity of one plus one minus our marginal tax rate of 34% times 5,000 divided by the value of our equity when we lever up, which is 6,700, which we saw in a previous example. And that gives us a lever beta of 1.194. So as you can see here, as we continue to lever up, as we continue to borrow more, the levered beta is going to increase. And that means that our cost of equity is going to increase when we plug this beta into our formula for, for estimating the expected return or the required return. So our cost of equity in this case is going to increase. Uh, so this is just our cost of equity calculated using the capital asset pricing model. So it goes from 13.88% all the way up to 17.27%. And since we have all of the information necessary to calculate our weighted average cost of capital, so we have our cost of equity, we have our weights of debt and equity, we already got our cost of debt, we'll say that's 0.07 or 7%, and we know our marginal tax rate of 34%, we can estimate our weighted average cost of capital. And so here, what you can see is, as we lever up, the weighted average cost of capital declines. Why? Well, it's because we're using more of the cheaper debt, more debt, which has a cost of 7% compared to uh, say in this equal weighting case, 17% for the cost of equity. And that means that when we actually calculate the value of the firm, what we're doing is we're taking our free cash flow and dividing it by our weighted average cost of capital. And since our weighted average cost of capital is lower when we have equal weighting as opposed to an unlevered case, that increases the value of the firm by Again, the, the value of the tax shield. So 850 or thereabouts in the 25% debt case and 1,700 in or thereabouts in the, the equal weighted case. So let's summarize what we covered here. So the goal when you're levering up should always be to maximize your shareholder value. We're not maximizing the earnings per share. We're really just focusing on maximizing the share price. Next, we showed that there is a nonlinear relationship between leverage and earnings per share. For the most part, it's going to be an increasing relationship, but at a certain point, what you're going to see is that if the firm increases its leverage anymore, that cost of debt is going to become prohibitively large, and that's going to lead to a lower earnings per share because you're paying out more and more in interest expense. Next, we showed that leverage influences both the cash flows and the weighted average cost of capital, which obviously I just went through a big example involving that. And then finally, we showed that the value of the firm is increased by the total value of the tax shield when a firm levers up. So the total value of the tax shield is just the value of our debt multiplied by our tax rate. Well, uh, so that's all I have for this video, and I'll continue in part two, where I'll actually start to discuss some of the theories for capital structure, and then I'll also introduce the measures for leverage that we sometimes refer to, so uh, operating leverage and financial leverage. But if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me or stop by my office. I'll look for you then. Bye.